Welcome everyone to the Family Finance Surveys User Conference 2024. Um, I'm Jen and I'm from the UK Data Service. Um, I can see that people are still joining us at the moment, so we'll have a sort of gentle start to get us going. So this is the 2024 Family Finance Surveys User Conference, and I'm very happy to be introducing the conference today. We've got a great programme of talks ahead. The conference has been co-organised by the UK Data Service, DWP and the ONS. Um, my name's Jen and I'm from the UK Data Service. We've also got Emma Green in the background who's making sure everything goes smoothly. And you'll be hearing from the DWP and the ONS throughout the day. The aims of this conference are to sort of highlight and celebrate some of the data that we have on household finances and to give an opportunity to get the sort of data producers and data users together to share updates on the surveys and hear about new research and analysis using the data. The programme slides and abstracts are all on the online event page and you can see that there's a link to that in the chat for you to access. You can see a um, full copy of the programme there. We also encourage tweets from the day. So the hashtag for the conference is UKDS Family Finance 24. We'll take a quick look at the programme for today. So we'll start with some latest updates from the DWP, including a talk on developments in poverty measurement. We'll have a 15 minute comfort break at 11 o'clock. And then we'll have our keynote presentation from Daniel Edmiston from the London School of Economics and the Autonomous University of Barcelona. And Daniel will be talking about understanding the prevalence and effects of deep poverty through existing data infrastructure. The lunch break will be at 12. And then the afternoon session will start at 12.50 and we're going to have a session from the ONS who will give us the current survey updates and also present some new analysis, including work using administrative data. Um, there'll be a further presentation from the DWP. This time they'll be talking about transformation of the family resources survey, including integrating administrative data. And then we'll have a short break before our final session. And in our final session, we'll have four research papers which explore topics linked to pension age, debt, poverty and the costs associated with flooring in social housing. And so that's all of the preliminary information. Um, at this point, I'm going to pass over to um, the DWP to get ready for their first session. And this will be chaired by um, Scott Fox from the Department um, for work and pensions. Um, so I just pick up a question in the chat before you start. So um, there will be a recording of the sessions today and they'll be available from the event page um, that's uh, been linked to in the chat already. It will take a little bit of time and I think you'll be notified by email when the event materials are all available. So otherwise of that, I'll pass over to Scott. Thanks for that, Jen. So, yeah, as Jen's saying, there's a lot to get through today, a lot of exciting stuff happening. I hope that you agree. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you do have questions, as Jen was also saying, please put it in the chat box and then we'll, uh, the speaker will address the question at the end of their talk. If it's a simple question, if it needs a bit more context, then we'll come back to it a bit later on verbally because it'll be about five minutes or so at the end to uh, address things verbally. So yeah, hope that makes sense. And without much further ado, I'll pass this on to Joanna where she'll introduce herself and yeah, we'll look at the wider context before we go into the chat. Thanks so much, Scott. So you're going to bring up the slides. Lovely. Uh, so uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Joanna Littlechild. I'm head of surveys branch. Uh, I always have to say that I'm not responsible for all surveys that DWP has an interest in, but certainly for today's audience, my teams are responsible for the most important DWP survey, the Family Resources Survey and related outputs. Before we start, I don't need to remind people that we have just had an election, but at this stage it is too early to say what the outcome might mean for specific policies or any new analytical priorities. 
DWP colleagues are here today as analysts and we're talking about analytical updates and developments. We are not able to, to answer any questions on policy or post-election implications. We're sorry, here to I'll, talk. Uh, can you not see the slide? Oh, sorry about this. Uh, I'll continue with the introduction if you're able to uh, bring up the slides, Scott. Uh, yes, yeah, so as I was saying, DWP colleagues are here today as analysts and we are talking about analytical updates and developments. We are not able to answer any questions on policy or post-election implications. We're here to talk about the analysis and methodological developments with our users. Um, uh, just a brief reminder again, all updates on DWB statistics are published by the DWP Statistical Work Programme and relevant release strategies or updates on project web pages. So do check there for further updates in the future. Uh, and if people can see the slides now, you can see the link to the DWP Work Programme there for future reference. Thank you. Uh, so there are several updates and developments across projects to share today and colleagues from DWP will be introducing themselves. Thank you. That's the slide I need now, Scott. So given today's audience obviously do have an interest in DWP and research generally, I have been asked to highlight the DWP ARI. That's the areas of research interest. Um, more details on this are available on the website. In summary, the document summarises the most important research questions facing DWP over the next five to ten years. The purpose of the DWP Areas of Research Interest publication is to raise awareness amongst the external research community of the things that matter to DWP analysis. It is a separate DWP team who are responsible for the ARI, so if you are interested in more information, do contact the email address that is on the slide or look for more information on the internet. Again, you can see the links there in the slide. So after that brief introduction, uh, I'll hand over now to Claire, who is providing the FRS update. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. So I'm Claire Cameron from the Family Resources Survey team in DWP. There's links here to all our published material, latest report and accompanying documents and also our team mailbox address if you have any questions after the event. I'm going to go through some of the key points from our latest edition that was published in March. That was for survey year 2022 to 23. So in addition to the publication, the data sets are available on the UK data service, the ONS Secure Research Service, and now also on the Stat Explore online tool. So users are able to go and create your own tables going back to data to 2002. The FRS continues to be one of the country's large scale household surveys. In fact, last year we had 40,000 adults in sample. However, we are aware, like many surveys, that household response is falling, it continues to be challenging, and as such, we're looking at approximately 29,000 adults in the sample for 2023-24. The themes of the FRS, we continue to focus on the concepts that are core to the DWP policy arena. So income from a variety of sources, including state benefit receipts and investments, um, backed up with characteristics about individuals and households and with cross-cutting themes such as material deprivation and more recently household food security and food bank usage. As an accredited official statistic, we focus on trustworthiness, quality and value. And this year, in respect of trustworthiness, we have changed our background information and methodology paper so it now aligns to the format of the GSS background quality report. And in recent times, we have introduced a release strategy, and this allows us to be transparent in our plans for future years. I've got the link for you here. We typically um, include in this what we're going to be doing in the next two years following the most recent publication. With regards to quality, 
couple of examples here. Um, rural urban indicators have been on the data set for a number of years, but they're more important now because they're used in our published food bank usage tables. We've updated those to align with the census 2011 classifications and we'll update again to 2021 when we're able to do so. Cost of living payments were an important component of income for many households in the last two years. And as such, we've included those in all relevant income variables on the data set. Um, users of the FRS will be aware that we have derived variables which calculate benefit unit and household income. And as such, we've included cost of living payments in all of those. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> so um, moving on to value. Um, we continue to add value and make sure that the questionnaire is relevant to our users by having our annual user, user engagement exercise, commonly known as QCON. Um, we both add questions and remove them to make sure things that are no longer relevant aren't eating into the time of the questionnaire. I've included some examples here of important new variables that were added in 22-23. Um, users told us that it would be useful to be able to plan adult social care and the related benefits. And with regards to adding the variable shelter to, we introduced a question to ask whether the accommodation is supported housing or not. With the um, increasing migration and growth of the use of universal credit, it's important for those who are renting for us to be able to establish what the rent payment arrangements are. And also we've introduced the variable receipt to collect the amount of rent after the benefits have been paid directly to the landlord or the property agent. Um, with regards to local authority care, users said that it would be good to be able to distinguish whether care is being paid for by the local authority, by private funds or indeed a combination of both. To um, consider people who may be at risk of becoming homeless, we've added variables at leave and at reason, and these are a result of questionnaires and um, questions to monitor housing stability and identify the types of household that may be at risk. Thank you, Scott. Okay, so we have one minute left. Okay. So this slide highlights the new chapter in the FRS this year. We've had childcare data on the data set for over 10 years, but we thought it was time to highlight some of this information. So as you see, we have um, maps here showing that um, the difference by region of informal childcare use, used much more predominantly in Scotland, Northern Ireland and the Northeast, compared to formal childcare being used more predominantly in the southeast and London. Users told us it'd be useful to see the differences between types of childcare provided. So we have a whole range of tables that show not just the difference between formal and informal, but more detailed breakdown. And as you can see on our other chart I show here, we show how payments differ by age of child and whether the child is or isn't attending school. Um, that's everything from me. I'm going to swiftly pass to Dawn for Households Below Average Income. Thank you, Claire. Hi, I'm Dawn McDonough. I work in the Households Below Average Income HBAI team. So there's a link to our collections page on gov.uk and also our team mailbox. Thank you, Scott. Next slide. So HBAI AI, our annual accredited official statistics focusing on UK living standards. It's a key source of data and information about poverty estimates and household income. It meets DWP statutory obligation to publish a measure of relative and absolute low income and combined low income and material deprivation for children under Section 4 of the Welfare Reform and Work Act 2016. Our estimates uh, are available for average incomes, income inequality, percentages and numbers of, ch of individuals, so children, working age adults and pensioners living in low income households, also material deprivation, household food insecurity and household food bank usage. 
Main findings are presented in our 2223 report, along with our methodology report and extensive published tables on gov.uk. Our data is available on Stat Explore, along with a user guide and via the UK data service, again with extensive user documentation. So please do get in touch with our team uh, via our team mailbox with any feedback and any queries. Thank you. So for HBAI 2223, cost of living support schemes were included in our estimates of household income. Separate ad hoc analysis was published illustrating the impact of cost of living support on our 23 low income statistics. We used a mixed mode in FRS 2223, and this is detailed in an annex presenting the effect of the over overall sample composition and the degree of impact on our statistics. And just to note that there are separate technical reports available for 2021 and also 2122. Changes are assessed against 2122 or the pre pandemic estimates and trends, and we continue to advise users that changes in estimates over recent years should be interpreted, being mindful of the differences in data collection approaches across the pandemic period and the effect this has had on the sample composition. Uh, all three average estimates remain based on two data points for any period, including 2021. Next year, the calculation will revert to using three data points. Our material deprivation time series resumed, calculating the changes in the estimates since 1920, when responses were last comparable. Estimates for 2021 and 21-22 are presented as individual data points in our published charts, and we advise users not to make direct comparisons with pre-pandemic pre estimates. Looking forward to HBAI 2324, there has been a review of the material depri deprivation measures. So as announced in the FRS release strategy and the statistical work programme, the first results based on the new questions are expected to be published in HBAI 2324 release in March 2025. And Lottie is providing a presentation on the LSE review. Thank you, I'll pass over to Helen. Morning. Um, so I'm um, Helen Smith and I work on producing the income dynamics statistics here at DWP. Um, next slide, please, um, Scott. So just by way of some background, um, income dynamics is annual official statistics that has been published by the DWP since 2018. And we use the Longitudinal Understanding Society survey run by the University of Essex to produce statistics on persistent low income, as well as movements into and out of low income and across the wider income distribution. So a bit like HBAI, Income Dynamics meets the legal requirement for government to publish an annual measure of the percentage of children in persistent low income. Our latest March publication covered 12 years of uh, USOC data from 2010 through to 2022. I'm just going to run through some of the headline findings from that publication. So starting with persistent low income, this measures the percentage of individuals who are in relative low income for three out of any of the most four uh, recent survey waves. And the chart here shows figures for the most recent four wave period in the uh, slightly bolder colours compared to the previous four wave period in the lighter shades. And these are presented for children, working age adults and pensioners separately on the left hand side and then all individuals just um, off to the right. Um, and we show these rates separately based on the income distribution before and after housing costs are taken into account in uh, blue and orange respectively. And um, what we see um, is that rates of persistent low income for children after housing costs are taken into account and by some distance the highest rates, most recently 17%, while the BHC rate for children is 10%, which is just above the average for all individuals. Working age adults have lower BHC rates, but as with children, once you take housing costs into account, this results in higher rates of persistent low income for this group. Um, pensioners have um, above average um, BHC persistent low income rates, which reflects pension incomes, but below average after housing cost rates, which reflects the higher uh, levels of outright home ownership among this group. And over time, um, persistent low income is a pretty stable measure. 
So although we saw some very small changes this year compared to the last four wave period, there isn't really um, much in by way of a longer term trend on these rates. Um, so next slide, please, Scott. And then moving on to look at um, income dynamics measures of income mobility. Over the short term, we look at um, movements into and out of relative low income across each two wave period. And we present these as movements, um, as rates of low income entry and exit. And across the most recent two waves, the before housing costs exit and entry rates are included here. Um, and what we see of those who, who were in low income in the first of the two waves, 38% exited from it. Um, while of those who were not in low income in the first of the two waves, 8% entered into low income. Um, but we have to remember here that when we calculate these rates, the exit rates are notably higher, and that's because they're based on a much smaller denominator, um, those who were in relative low income in the first of the two waves, while the entry rates are based, based on a much larger denominator of those who were not in low income in the first of the two waves. And what we typically see, though, in fact, is roughly equivalent numbers of individuals moving into and out of low income across each two wave period. In order to try and understand these movements a bit better, um, Income Dynamics has for the last um, two to three years included some events analysis, which looks at a range of different descriptive statistics, illustrating the relationship between what happens within households and um, these movements into and out of low income. Um, and there's lots of different statistics on this in our publication. Um, so, yeah, do take a look if you're interested. But the key kind of headline that we've seen um, is that employment changes are really closely related to these movements, but specifically gains or losses in full time employment, which have a really close relationship with entries and exits. Um, and then finally, on the right hand side is just an illustration relating to longer term income mobility analysis looking at movements across the full income distribution, um, which we divide into income quintiles, five equally sized groups, comparing people's position in 21 to 22, the most recent wave, to where they were back in 2015-16. And the, the key sort of finding from this is that most of the movement takes place towards the middle of the distribution, with less at the top and the bottom. And again, this, this, is, this sort of broad picture hasn't really changed much since this analysis started. Um, so, yeah, that's the headlines from Income Dynamics. There is a lot more in the publication, so please do get in touch or check that out um, if you want any more information on that. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to, is it John next? It is. Thank you. Hello, my name's John Bilverstone and I work for surveys, but I work within the longitudinal surveys PI and take up team. And as you can see from the slide there, there's a um, four links there the top two are the links to uh, two publications that my team produce which are the pensioners income publication and the income related benefits estimates of take of publication and uh, the two uh, links below that are actually links to uh, the email well the email addresses for the team inboxes for these publications so Obviously, I'm going to talk about the publications themselves, but if anybody's got any queries afterwards, please feel free to uh, use those links to uh, send us any queries that you have. Uh, next slide, please, Scott. The first uh, publication that I mentioned was the Pensioners Income publication. And this is an annual accredited official statistical publication which reports on pensioners' incomes used uh, via the FRS survey. The stat statistics examine how much income pensioners get each week and where they get that income from. So the publication looks at how their incomes have changed over time and variations in income between different types of pensioners. The estimates are normally based on a sample of around 7,000 pensioners. Uh, for financial year 22-23, there were actually 9,390 pensioners who were uh, used for the publication. And just let you know that this year's publication, we added two new tables to the table pack in response to user feedback, one of which shows the uh, overall income distribution, and the other new table shows the number of pension units within the income from state pension and state benefits only. 
just as similar to other publications, PI data is available to users on Stack Explore, and it's also available via the UK data service. In financial year 22-23, the PI estimates also included the cost of living payments. Next slide, please, Scott. Uh, this slide is a, a particular, this is information taken from the latest PI publication. Hopefully you can see that the population age distribution has changed quite a bit since the start of this series in 94, 95, and pensioners now make up a larger proportion of the overall po population. Changes in the economy and to the benefit system mean that the amount and components of pen pensioners' average weekly incomes has changed quite a bit over time. So obviously this publication contains information regarding these changes. Two key results of the publication are mentioned in the slide there. So in FY 2023, pensioners had an, had an average median income of £387, which was a statistically significant increase from financial year ending 1995, when it was only £195. The other thing to note is that the average median income for pensioner couples was £561 per week. Single pensioners had an average income of £267 per week. The difference between these is statistically significant. Other information to note is that field work for the, uh, financial, for the FRS survey during the COVID-19 pandemic was greatly affected by a change to telephone interviewing. So for financial year 2023, field work operations for the FRS returned with face-to-face -face survey as this was the preferred method of interviewing, with telephone interviewing retained just as an alternative. While some of this change is real, reflecting below infla inflation uprating of the state pension in financial year 2023 and a reduction in the value of occupational pensions re relative to inflation, the degree of change is also likely to have somewhat been affected by changes in the pensioner sample composition between survey years. This broader context should be taken into consideration when interpreting observed changes in pensioners' incomes in a comparison to financial year 2020 is recommended. Next slide, please, Scott. This is a slide uh, with information regarding the other publication which our team produces, and this is the Income Related Benefits of Take-Up publication, which contains statistics for pension credit and housing benefit for pensioners. It's an annual publication report which reports on the take-up of benefits from the FRS survey. Take-up refers to the receipt of benefits that somebody is entitled to, both by caseload and expenditure. FRS data is matched to administrative data to produce estimates for the main income related benefits, which obviously, as I stated earlier, is currently for pension age only. So hence pension credit and housing benefit for pensioners. Hopefully you can see from the slide that eight out of 10 people entitled to pension credit actually claim the benefit. And 72% of the amount of pension credit that could have been claimed was claimed. And for housing benefit for pensioners, eight out of 10 people who are entitled to HB for pensioners, uh, for pensioners, yes, was claimed by, for this benefit. And 84% of the amount of HB expenditure that could have been claimed was claimed. When you look at our publication further, the estimates show that the caseload has actually increased by 880,000 families who were entitled to receive pension credit but did not claim the benefit, and the expenditure was actually up by 2.1 billion. On average, this amount amounts to around 2,200 people pounds per year for each family entitled to receive pension credit. For housing benefit, the caseload, the estimates show that the caseload actually increased by 360,000 pensioners and the expenditure was up by 1.3 billion. So on average, this amounts to around 3,400 pounds per year for each family entitled to receive housing benefit pen for pensioners who did not claim the benefit. Uh, particular uses of our publication are that the first PC day of action was on the 15th of June 
2022. This was an initiative to try and increase the take up of pension credit and encourage people to claim it if they were entitled to it. Our statistics were heavily used in this campaign. The other thing to note is that during the week of action on the 13th of June 2023, Martin Lewis did a pension special program on ITV and he encouraged viewers to check if they were actually eligible for PC and our stats were actually used in that. Just for further information, we're due to release our next publication for financial year in 2023 in September, October of this year. But obviously, we'll officially pre-announce the publication date four weeks in advance as of the usual protocol. Next slide, please, Scott. This is a slide for information because as well as the pension age side of things that we uh, produce the take up publication for, we've actually started development on a new take up measure for universal credit. But we're unable to complete this work at this current point in town time due to the managed migration of claimants on UC as part of the UC rollout, rollout program, because there are still lots, large numbers of people in receipt of legacy benefits and the UC take up rate would not provide the full picture of what was happening for the entitled working age population. As you can imagine, to develop a methodology that takes account of both UC and legacy benefits and credits, there's obviously several complex conceptual and methodological issues that we're having to work through. Because we know this is such an important publication, it's important that we get it right and to contain quality statistics. Hence, it's taken us quite a while to develop and obviously we'll keep everybody informed of our progress on our release strategy document, which is on our publication homepage. Last slide, please, Scott. Yeah, one minute. OK, this is just a final slide to make sure that people are aware that a team within the same director as ourselves have actually uh, released a publication called the Unfulfilled Eligible eligibility in the benefit system financial year ending 2024. This slide really just to let you know that this publication estimates how much money extra money claimants could be getting if they told us accurately about their circumstances. And these estimates are based on information that was previously included in the fraud, fraud and error element of the benefit system statistics as claimant error underpayments. So this is just really to say that this is a completely separate publication to the one we do uh, obviously do ourselves and it does not cover the take up of benefits. It's just that we've started receiving a few uh, queries from people asking if this is the same as what uh, we plan to re release as part of our work and age publication and obviously from the pension side of things as well. So obviously we just want to make it clear that it's a completely separate publication to the one that we uh, produce ourselves. OK, thank you, Scott. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Lottie Devaney. I'm a statistician and I work in um, policy group. And my team leads the um, policy analysis and analytical briefing on various me um, measures of disadvantage, including material deprivation, which is what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to talk for about um, 10 to 15 minutes about the material deprivation review which Dawn mentioned as part of the HBAI update. So DWP commissioned the Centre for Analysis of Social Exclusion at the London School of Economics and Political Science to carry out this review in December 2021. And we published the results in March of this year. Um, the publication's linked on the slide and I'll also share it in the chat later. I'm going to start with a quick intro into the concept, how it was measured and conceptualised previously, as in per the last publication. And then I'm going to go through the revised questions um, and the steps that we have to take next. So this slide shows a visual representation of the position of material deprivation on a standard living standard of living scale. So it's in the orange circle on the slide. Um, the threshold for material deprivation is positioned um, along this continuum of standard of living. So this can go from very low levels to very high levels. And the threshold for material deprivation is positioned somewhere between destitution, which is on the left, where people might lack access to very type, basic types of necessities, such as food, clothing and shelter. Um, and then there's a low but comfortable standard of living a bit further to the right, where people have sufficient resources to afford some luxuries. Material deprivation 
can be defined as the inability to afford items that are socially perceived as essential to meet a minimum standard of living. And this is measured by DWP in the Family Resources Survey by a series of questions which ask whether respondents lack a series of items. And then, then ask some follow-up questions about why they lack those items. And lack can be defined in terms of affordability, so people might say it's due to income, but we also might look at other barriers such as um, health or disability, or we might just look at whether or not an item is missing without any reason. In order for the measures to capture contemporary material deprivation, it's important that the necessities included are periodically reviewed to ensure that they reflect public perceptions of necessities. So now just moving on to the next slide, please which outlines the reasons why we carried out um, the review and what the objectives were. So like I said, we collect the items um, in the Family Resources Survey and we publish annual estimates as part of the Households Below Average Income publication for working age adults, pensioners and children. And the children estimates make up a currently statutory measure. So there was two main reasons why we reviewed these. Um, the first being that these are national statistics and measures have to be periodically reviewed to ensure that they're still meeting our national statistics standards and ensure that material deprivation continues to accurately measure what it should and that the items for all groups were last updated um, were last reviewed over a decade ago. The second reason is the Office for Statistics Regulation also made several recommendations in relation to the official UK material deprivation measures in 2021 and this included a recommendation that we review the current set of questions that underpin material deprivation. So the aims of the review were to explore in main four different things. So first, which material deprivation items for families with children, working age adults and pensioners should be included. The second being the advantages and disadvantages of different approaches to determine who is materially deprived. The advantages and disadvantages of developing a core set of questions for the whole population alongside those measures aimed at like the individual types of people. And then finally, just whether or not the advantages of, it, of updating the material deprivation measures outweigh the disadvantages. So the next slide outlines the four components which fed into the recommendations of the necessities to include. And this is the steps that LSE went through to conduct the review. So the orange boxes set out those four stages and they represent how they fed into the blue box which is the recommendations. Um, the first stage was an evidence review to understand existing and previous approaches to measuring material deprivation. And from this, we got a long list of 103 items and this fed into every other stage of the process. Um, so it wasn't just one, two, three, four, one fed into all the different stages as well. The second set of processes we had, um, well, LSE ran focus groups with representative participants from across the UK. So central to this concept of material deprivation is that these items should reflect what's socially perceived. Um, so participants were selected to be representative of different age groups, income groups, ethnicity, gender, household types and disability. And then from this, we got a short list of 35 items. Um, and this was devised using data collected in the focus groups and the literature review, including information about prevalence. So how many people ha had these items? support for the items, the potential impact of variation in tastes, differences in costs, and whether an item or activity is likely specialist for like a specific group of the population. These 35 items were then included in the Family Resources Survey's test questions during April, May and June of 22. And then in the fourth stage, statistical analysis was conducted on the test question data to determine what should finally be included in the revised material deprivation measures. And this included statistical tests of reliability, um, validity and suitability. After considering the results of these tests and finding from the research to date, it was recommended that six of the test items would be omitted from the revised measures and this resulted in a final list of 29 necessities. Um, so the evidence and recommendations for the new items were then presented to and approved um, by the review steering group. So that's kind of the process of the review. I'm now going to talk about the current approach a bit. So the current being the one that was last published. Um, so in our previous publication of material deprivation, we use a prevalence weighted approach. Um, and this slide just kind of sets out there's, there's two steps to it. And it's a technique of scoring deprivation in which more weight in the deprivation measure is given to families who lack items that most families already have. So this means that we put greater importance when an item is lacked if it's more commonly owned within the population. 
So this has to do two steps. The first being we ask everyone whether or not they own the item. And then these responses are used to create a score for each item based on how many people actually lack it. And this kind of introduces a relative element to the measure. And items which are lacked by less people are given a higher weight. Um, so I'm now going to talk through um, some details specific to pensioners, working age adults and children. So starting with pensioners. So these are the current questions as per what were published. Um, for pensioners, we currently use a kind of a wider definition of material deprivation, which looks beyond just financial constraint. This was introduced after it was found previously that pensioners were reluctant to report that they lack an item due to financial constraint which could lead to under-reporting of material deprivation for this group. So in the current measure, pensioners are classed as materially deprived if they indicate they don't have an item for any reason, which is highlighted in bold on the slide. Um, so that's basically any reason apart from if they say they don't want an item or it's not relevant to them. They're asked about access to 15 items, and if their total prevalence weighted score is over 20, then they are defined as materially deprived. I'm now going to move on to look at children and working age adults. So um, for children and working age adults, follow up questions are asked just to establish whether or not they lack an item due to affordability or because they don't want or need it. So we don't ask about like the kind of other more granular questions. Um, with, so people are only considered materially deprived if they indicate that they lack an item because they cannot afford it due to financial constraint. For children, parents are asked if they cannot afford 21 items for children, and then if the score is over 25, they are defined as materially deprived. In our um, Households Below Average Income publication, it's combined with a low income measure in the national statistics, but we produce all measures on Stacks for, so it's available to just look at what material deprivation is like and some combination with other low income measures. For working age adults, so next slide please, um, a subset of the children material deprivation questions is asks, asked to adults. So they're asked if they can't afford, if they can afford, sorry, nine items, and then they're given a score of the item if they can't afford it. If the total score is over 25, again, they're classified as materially deprived and it's published in the same way as we do for children, but all measures are available on um, Stack Explore. So in terms of what we have already accepted as a result of the review, um, we have new items now, um, including a standardised set of household level questions. So these household items have been introduced to allow for the potential of developing an all age deprivation measure. But they also mean that for multi age households, we don't have to ask um, very similar questions multiple times. Um, and we also have a standardised but shortened list of reasons for lacking items for all ages. So it's shortened in terms of what we previously asked pensioners. So we've dropped two of the pensioner follow-up questions. And obviously it's an expansion on what we did ask for working age and children. And um, so we've standardized those follow-up questions. Also to assess the impact of moving to this revised material deprivation measure, we split the family resources survey sample in 23-24 with 75% of um, respondents asked the new questions and 25% the previous ones. This is to allow us to say what was happening for material deprivation in this year under both measures. So the next few slides just summarise the new questions against the old ones just to kind of show what's changed. So this is the pensioner questions and the orange are where the, the like wording has changed, but the kind of the items very similar. So for pensioners, we previously had 15 questions and we now have 18. And I think the biggest change is um, on the household questions, so these apply to everyone, but it's the addition of questions relating to digital access. And then we've removed some items as well, which includes things like access to landlines. The next slide shows the questions for children and working age adults side by side. Um, so for children, we've gone from 21 to 22 items, so a little change in the number. Again, obviously we have the addition of internet access, but we also have added some other questions in, like, for example, whether or not there's space for children to do their homework. And then the biggest change has been for working age adults, where we previously only had nine items because it was originally like a subset of the children question. So we now have um, 21 items. Oh, no, sorry, 22. Um, and this includes the obviously additional questions about internet access, but also some relating to preparing for later life. So we ask about if people can make regular pension payments, Others relating to health, such as if people are having three meals a day, eating fresh fruit or veg daily, 
And we also ask about employment related questions as well. So like whether or not people have clothes um, for like work or a job interview. So that's where we've got to with the review. I'm now just going to quickly go through the kind of remaining recommendations and then finally our next steps. So this is the point we're at in the review. So we or DWP are going to be reviewing the following recommend recommendations which were provided in the review from LSE. So we've got a number relating to firstly the type of approach that we take. So I mentioned that we use this prevalence weighted approach. So there's additional research that we're recommended to carry out to establish the impact of prevalence weighting. And if there's the potential to move to a simple count measure, which is where we wouldn't weight the items. If we decide to continue with prevalence weighting, there is also recommendations to consider given certain items the weight of one um, and some further analysis around income gradients. We then have a couple relating to setting the new threshold, including developing a composite standard of living measure and then using a combination of statistical analysis and judgment to decide where our new thresholds are going to be set. We have some specific recommendations around our publication, um, one being that we publish a new series based on estimates of material deprivation alone, currently published in Stat Explore, but as part of the publication itself. Um, another being that our headline statistics for combined measures should be based on after housing costs rather than before housing costs. Again, we publish both within Stack Explore um, and that we also report um, the details of the decision decisions made and both material estimate, material deprivation estimates. So based on our split sample, we then had a number of recommendations for further research to develop um, this kind of all age measure without which it was recommended that it continue to be measured at the individual level. And then our final slide just details are kind of the next steps. Um, so the updated items were included in the 23-24 edition of the Family Resources Survey. Um, so we obviously finished data collection at the end of financial year 23-24. Um, and the new estimates are gonna be published in our March 25 publication. Once obviously the data is available, we're undertaking the further analysis to like finalise these new measures and provide details of the decisions made. And this is going to be published again alongside our publication in March 25. And then finally, obviously, as I mentioned previously, to allow us to assess the impact of moving to the revised material deprivation measure, we have split the FRS sample to allow us to do this. And this assessment will also be published alongside the revised measures in March 25. Um, and that's everything for me. So I think I'm now handing over to Emma. Thanks, Lottie. I think you might have broken up, but uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, so my name is Emma McRae and I'm here with my colleague Andrew Blacklock to talk to you about a new measure of poverty that we're developing in DWP called the Below Average Resources Statistics. I'm a statistician working in the Income, Families and Disadvantage Analysis Division within the DWP and focus primarily on the work that we'll be talking to you about today. I'll just pass over to Andrew to introduce himself. Hi everyone, my name is Andrew Blacklock and I'm also a statistician uh, from the Income, Families and Disadvantage Analysis Division at DWP. Fab, thanks. Next slide, please. So some of you may have already heard of the new poverty measure that we're going to be talking about today. Um, but for those who don't know, we will give a bit of an overview of the background to the new measure and um, a summary of some of the key initial insights that and that we've got from the measure so far and the further development needed to ensure the measure is robust. Next slide, please. So what is this measure and why are we developing it? Next slide. So as you'll be aware, there are a wide variety of ways to measure poverty and there's currently no real consensus on the best way to measure it. Baroness Stroud wanted to solve this and so founded the Social Metrics Commission or the SMC in 2016. And what the commission does is aim to develop a new measure, um, a new approach to poverty measurement that both better reflects the nature and experiences of poverty that different families in the UK have and that can be used to build a consensus around poverty measurement and action in the UK. The SMC published their methodological approach in 2018 and the measure that we are developing and we'll be talking about today is based on this methodological approach. The new approach builds on existing measures by accounting for families additional costs and savings and addressing some methodological limitations with current measures. In the next slide I'll be giving an overview of kind of the details of the framework and I'll give a bit of a brief overview of some of the key points, but um, I'm very happy to take any questions if anyone would like further detail on it. So 
the basis of the new measure is the net income, which is currently used in our existing statistics under HBAI. And the measure is built on this, but adds other aspects to it. So specifically other resources through the inclusion of liquid assets and savings and other constraints through mandated debt repayments and the additional inescapable costs of things like childcare, disability costs and additional housing costs, specifically mortgage capital repayments. So these elements are kind of added to or taken away from the net income measure used in existing measures to create a value of total resources available. And this is done on a sharing unit level, which is a new level, so different from household or benefit unit level, which the current statistics are at. But it's at sharing unit level, which the SMC define as everyone who is related to each other living in the same household. So once we've calculated this TRA or total resources available value for all of the families, this is then used to determine whether or not they are in poverty in comparison to others. So this is a relative measure rather than an absolute one. So a couple of points to bring out here which are different in the kind of SMC or the bar approach from existing um, statistics is that the median income that is used to calculate the poverty threshold is based on an average of the TRA families TRAs over three years. So not longitudinally, but just the average like of each of the um, TRA values for the samples over three years rather than one year. And this accounts for the fact that it takes time for social norms to change and works to try and counter some of the issues with relative poverty measures in that they sometimes give counterintuitive results during economic downturns. So once they have that kind of average median um, TRA value, they set their poverty threshold at 54% of this median and if, uh, after equivalizing it. Um, and this, the reason why they set it at 54% is they wanted to match the levels of relative poverty after housing costs in 2016-17. And this is the time that the poverty measure was developed. And the reason why they're doing this sort of to match existing levels of poverty is that they wanted to change and add to the understanding of who is in poverty or poverty composition rather than the overall levels of poverty. They also make an adjustment for overcrowding and unmet housing need. So they adjust the resources available to a family, if, assuming that they will be renting additional an additional room to meet their housing needs. So once they've done that and calculated the poverty threshold and done the overcrowding adjustment, they get a measure, kind of a poverty rate that we would sort of normally be used to. So how many people or sharing units are in poverty? But what they added as well um, to existing measures is they contextualize this kind of poverty rate into a wider framework. So the main things that they've included are poverty depth, so looking at how far above and below the line people fall, looking at kind of the distribution, the persistence of poverty, so adding in additional longitudinal data to see how long people are in poverty for. And they also created a set of what they call lived experience indicators, and these are characteristics associated with being in poverty, so things like health outcomes, employment outcomes, family outcomes, and they kind of situate their poverty metric within that. They also acknowledge that not all groups are represented in household surveys that this is based on and so try and make a start to address this by adding um, a count of the rough sleepers to their estimate of the number of people in poverty. Next slide. So that kind of gives you an overview of what the new measure is about, what it does, um, but how does it fit into existing poverty measures in the poverty measurement landscape? So this slide is a bit of an illustration of the poverty measures that we currently have and you can see in kind of the light blue color where the SMC approach and what we're calling the bar below average resources statistics sit. So it's most closely related to the relative poverty measure in HBAI after housing costs, but it does cut across other poverty measures and um, specifically kind of the wider framework that I was just talking about. So poverty depth and persistence um, and the lived experience indicators as well. Um, we are mostly focusing on the development of the main poverty metrics with so kind of poverty rates and, and poverty depth, but we'll be picking up the bits that are in dashed lines later, later on down the line. Next slide. So that's the measure of poverty and how it fits into things, but what are we doing in DWP? And so to give you a bit of context on this, following the SMC's publication of their approach in 2018, DWP started work developing the measure in 2019, but this did have to be paused due to COVID and reprioritization. Um, and during that time when it was paused in, in 2021, the Office for Statistics Regulation um, recommended that 
the DWP and ONS consider this approach and how it could add value to our current measures of poverty. And so last year, um, the DWP announced the inten our intention to resume developing the measure, and that's what our team have been working on since then. So I'll now hand over to Andrew, who will talk through what we've been doing. Great, thanks, Emma. Um, so our first publication released in January this year under the official statistics in development label, where we set out our initial project framework. Uh, this publication included analysis of poverty rates and various breakdowns with comparison to existing measures. And alongside these statistics, we also published an open consultation with the aim of seeking feedback from users of the data, which we can then use to develop the measure going forward. Next slide, please. So we wanted to share some of the key findings from our first report today to explore the question of how the new bar measure could change our understanding of poverty. Uh, there's lots more information in our report if you want to have a look at it, um, but we've drawn out some of the key results here. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of overall poverty rates, this chart shows the results from the below average resources measure in orange and HBI relative low income after housing cost measure, which is the closest ex existing measure in blue. Um, both being split into age groups. So in general, the bar measure does not fundamentally change the view of which groups have the highest or lowest poverty rates. So children generally have higher poverty rates, while pensioners generally have, generally have lower. Uh, however, the bar measure does exacerbate these differences. So children who already have relatively high poverty rates under the existing measures have even higher rates under bar compared to HBI, and pensioners have even lower. Working age individuals have similar rates, though slightly higher under bar, as you can see there. Next slide, please. So to further show the different types of people captured by the bar measure, these Venn diagrams show the people in each population subgroup captured by the different poverty measures in 2021-22. The gray intersection in the middle of the Venn diagrams shows the number and proportion of people who are considered to be in both low resources under the bar measure and relative low income after housing costs under the HBI measure. The blue section on the left of the diagrams captures the people who are in poverty under HBI and not bar. And the orange section on the right shows the opposite, those who are in poverty under bar, but not under HBI. Most of the Venn diagrams for these subgroups are roughly even, showing similar proportions of people captured by just one measure. However, one of the more skewed ones we can see is for pensioners on the bottom left, where there are a larger number of people who are only counted as being in poverty on HBI, but not bar. This is likely due to the inclusion of assets, which increases the uh, resources available to them, so may push people who are close to the poverty line over it under the new measure. These insights show how the bar measure could add to our understanding of poverty and potentially shape policymaking. For example, looking at the diagram in the bottom right, um, the larger the proportion of individuals in the family where someone is disabled in poverty under the new measure could direct policies aiming to reduce po poverty to target these groups rather than other who may others who may now be less likely to be in poverty. Next slide, please. We also want to investigate the new measurement framework and whether it's working as intended. Particularly, we're interested in the prevalence uh, of each of the components of the measure and the difference they make over the base measure of income. So the chart on the left shows how many individuals are affected by each of the added components of TRA over time. Each line signifies a different component of TRA and the proportion of the population that's affected by them. So you can see at the bottom, childcare costs are the least prominent component, only affecting roughly 10% of the population. Disability costs affect a similar proportion, although slightly higher in the most recent year. And we then have around 30% of the population having more mortgage capital costs deducted from their overall TRA. And then the most prominent component by far, assets, which is a net positive for a TRA, affects roughly two thirds of the population. So overall, 95% of the of individuals have at least one additional component affecting their overall TRA, which captures just how many people this new method of measuring poverty will impact. On the right, we can see how this changes across the distribution of TRA, which has been split into 20 even groups. Income tends to gradually increase as you progress up the Vigintiles. However, we can see an exponential growth in the proportion of TRA that's composed of assets from the 70th percentile onwards. This results in assets actually making up the majority of total resources, resources available for those in the top 5% of TRAs. Next slide, please. One of the other areas we were interested in when analyzing this measure was how methodological changes in the measure could affect poverty rates. We first looked at unit size, so HBI calculates their poverty measures at household level, but SMC uses the slightly smaller sharing unit level. And as you can see, there's a, there is a very minimal difference in changing the unit size to the overall poverty rate, so that's not a change we explored further. Another key aspect of the methodology behind the new measure, it's a poverty threshold. SMC set the po their poverty threshold at 54% of the median TRA, which is baseline to the number of people in, pop in relative low income in 2016-17. 
We investigated the effects of altering this, first to 50% of the median TRA and then to 60% and 70%. And as you might expect, the higher the threshold, the more people that fall into poverty. Uh, we found that if we were to set the threshold at 70% of the median, a third of the population would then fall below and be considered to be in low resources. The SMC also uses a three-year smooth median to mitigate the effects of sudden economic downturns, which is not the case with current poverty measures. Looking at the chart on the top right, there we have the bar poverty threshold over time. The orange line is the base threshold with the three-year smoothing applied, and the light blue line is what it would look like with no smoothing applied. As you might expect, the general trend is the same, with uh, the no smoothing line being slightly more volatile, particularly around the time of the 2009 recession. The no smoothing line flattens out for a few years, reflecting a drop in the growth rate of median incomes, and then rises more sharply once we enter the post-recession period. However, the smooth line is a bit better at counter counteracting the effects of this. Next slide, please. So beyond overall poverty rates, we also wanted to um, we also wanted to examine like the new measures relationship with other markers of poverty, specifically household food security and material deprivation, which is a measure of individuals' ability to afford essentials. When comparing MAP DEP and food insecurity rates, we particularly wanted to focus on those who are being captured by one measure but not the other. As you can see, those classified as in poverty on the bar measure but not HBAI have a much higher food insecurity rate and MAT debt rates across all age groups than those only classified as in poverty under HBAI. This suggests that the bar measure better correlates with household food insecurity and MAT debt compared to HBAI, and that it's better uh, at capturing disadvantaged individuals thanks to the addition of its various components. Next slide, please. Another aspect of poverty under this measure we were keen to analyze is the level of deep poverty. The left chart shows various TRA bands, which has been split into age groups, showing the proportion of each band that is made up, made up of children, working age adults, and pensioners. We found that children and working age individuals were most likely to be in poverty, or in deep poverty rather, with most of the composition of those with a TRA 25% below the poverty line being these two groups, which lines up with our previous analysis indicating that there were less pensioners in poverty overall. The right chart shows how uh, poverty depth has changed over time. We can see that the percentage of individuals in deep poverty has stayed fairly consistent since 2000, but we have seen a rise at all depth levels in the most recent year, with the most pronounced increase being for those who are just below the poverty line. Next slide, please. One I'll, now hand... I'll, I'll now hand over to Emma, who will discuss the further development of the measure. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so as we've mentioned, the bar statistics are designated as official statistics in development, and there's still further work required to develop the measure to ensure it's robust. Next slide, please. So some of the further work that's required includes considering the guiding overarching principles and any trade-offs that there might be, deep dives into the different components, looking at their methodolo method methodology, and updating the measure with the latest data. So all of this work will consider and feed into future consultation to ensure that the new measure is helpful for as helpful for user needs as possible. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for listening today to our overview of the new below average resources or BAR measure of poverty, our key insights from our first publication and the work needed to further develop the measure. You can look out for further updates on our web page linked here and from the Social Metrics Commission on their website if you're interested too. And we're very happy to answer questions in the chat about the methodology or analysis and do get in touch using our email if you can think of any questions after the session. Thank you.